people have such an understandable fear of their own mortality and of the pain of loss and the feeling that somebody that that someone that they love is inaccessible and it's not quite the case no it's not and we have you know there's that term that the the veil between this world and the next is really thin and that is the truth that we have the ability to part that veil anytime that we want in order to either enter that space or get communication from the other side. So hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you today. My guest today is so interesting. He's going to talk about things that may kind of rock your world in a way, but they're so important. And what he's going to speak about is a shared death experience. The reason I was really excited to have Dr. Scott Taylor on today is, among other things, that I have been listening to his audio programs for quite some time. And I was thinking about how two of our greatest fears are of our own death, which is guaranteed for everyone. And yet it is one of the topics that evokes more fear than anything and the fear we have of losing a loved one. So, Scott, I'm so happy to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Tracy. I have been looking forward to our conversation, so I'm very glad that you invited me. <laughs> well, wonderful. Now, I think it would be extremely helpful for our listeners is to get a sense first of what is a shared near-death experience. And, and I think the best way to do that is for you to share your story because it's so compelling. I'd, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, it took place in 1981. I was in love with a woman. Her name was Mary Frances Randall. And Mary Fran and her son Nolan had been out sailing um, on a lake in southern Minnesota. And on their way home from that beautiful day, uh, they were involved in a horrific car accident. And Mary Fran was killed outright. And her son Nolan, who just turned seven, uh, sustained a, a, a mortal head injury. And luckily, um, because we lived in southern Minnesota, um, both Mary Fran and Nolan um, were rushed to the Mayo Clinic. So they had some of the very best medical care in the whole world, um, but it wasn't enough to, to save Nolan. And it took him about six days where he made his transition. That becomes important because during that six days, um, Mary Fran was one of nine, and so she had a lot of brothers and sisters who had um, boyfriends and girlfriends and spouses and lots of uncles and aunts and neighbors and grandparents, and there were a lot of people who could converge on Rochester um, in order to hold vigil for Nolan as he was struggling to, uh, to stay alive. And because there were so many of us, um, we had kind of divvied it up so that two of us would go in every two hours into his hospital room to keep him company. And, you know, frankly, his hospital room wasn't that big. So it, it just, it just made sense. Um, and one of the nice things that happened was that, the uh, the nursing staff on the floor had told us that, uh, even though Nolan was in a coma because of his head injury, um, he could probably still hear us. And so it was important that we tell him stories or, you know, just engage him in, in a way that seemed natural. So as it turns out, um, my shift was with Janie, um, Mary Fran's oldest sister. And the two of us um, had the 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. shift on the morning of the sixth day. So we went in and we had, you know, his favorite storybooks and we read him stories and we told him about his uncles. Who <laughs> I still can't believe they did this. His uncles had gone throughout the, the Mayo Hospital at about midnight and stolen the cushions off of the couches and <laughs> brought them up to the waiting room so that people could have a place to lie down as they're, you know, there waiting and and 
you know, doing the vigil thing. So that meant that there were people, you know, just higgledy piggledy all over everywhere. And, um, you know, and we just, just told him who, who was there and what was going on. Well, it gets to be about quarter to five in the morning. And, um, Danny looks at me and, and she goes down to the end of the bed and she picks up the chart, take a look at, at where things are at. And then the, you know, looking at all the myriad of electronic devices that were surrounding his bed. And she just shook her head and said, you know, Scott, I think it's time for us to say goodbye. So we pulled up a couple of chairs next to his head and we told him how much we loved him and how much or how proud we were of his struggling to stay alive and and really struggling to be there with us um but then Janie said something i thought was really really wise she told him that if his mother would come to pick him up that that would be the right thing to do would be for him to go with her and that even though we would miss him terribly we would still love him and going with his mother was the right thing to do. Again, we told him we loved him. And by this time, it's five o'clock. And we got up and left and the next shift came in. Well, it wasn't, you know, 45 minutes later when the nurse came in. And she roused us all up and said um, that his vital signs were, were going down. And it was time for us to, to gather in the hospital room. So. There's this whole crew, and there had to be, I'm guessing, 40 of us. I mean, it was a lot oh, of people. Wow. And, you know, we all filed into this little hospital room. And, you know, it, just the way luck would have it, I was one of the last people to enter into the room. And it's already four and five deep around the bed. So I'm thinking to myself, well, that's just silly. You know, <laughs> I'm going to go over here and sit on the windowsill next to willie mary fran's youngest brother and and there we did we just we just sat and we you know there's not a lot to do as you're waiting for some somebody to transition the only thing there really is to do is to you know there's not a lot to do and really the only thing there is is to sit and watch the heart monitor you know as it goes through its thing and then it gets quieter and quieter and eventually it you know it just flatlines and when Nolan flatlined, what I witnessed was Mary Fran coming across the veil and scooping her son out of his physical body. And they had this exquisite reunion, as you could only imagine, between a mother and child. And I was surprised by that because I could feel what was going on between the two of them, and it was extraordinary. But what surprised me even more was that the two of them then turned to me, they came over, embraced me, and then the three of us left and, and went to the light. And when I entered into that space, I mean, Tracy, it's extraordinary. It is as if you have entered into the love of the universe, where we are all connected, where we are one with the divine, and we are one with everything that exists. But as awesome as that was, that really wasn't where my attention was because there were the three of us. It was Mary Fran and I and Nolan. And we had a chance to um, affirm our love and affection for each other. We had a chance to say our goodbyes because you know, I, I was at work when the accident happened, so I, I wasn't anywhere near the, the scene of the car crash. And then we had a chance just to, to be with each other. And then at some point, it just seemed complete. There really wasn't any kind of like, oh, you're done, you know. Or, you know it, it, it wasn't like that. It was like what needed to be said had been said, and... And I could see that they were fine and they could see I would be fine. And and then they turned and, and left and went further into the light. And I came back to my to my physical body. 
So there I was, you know, back in, in the hospital room sitting on the windowsill. So, you know, Tracy, that's like part A of my story. Uh, is there anything you want to ask before I go to part B? I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I need to get a tissue. You can see I'm very moved by this, um, understandably. <laughs> I may have to do that more than once. <laughs> um, first, I, I want to just say I am so sorry for your loss. I know that it was some time ago, but, you know, I could feel and see as you were talking about this, how, how intense this experience was and how, how, how deeply personal and um, how moving it is even today, of course. And again, I'm so sorry for your loss. Well, thank you. And I need to explain something because, you know, sometimes it gets really emotional and it's, it's a complicated emotion because as, as I talk about what happened, it's this weird intermingling of the sorrow about losing the two of them, but it's also the joy, the ecstasy, the, um, the, the unbridled love and compassion that is that space. And so when I think about it, you know, you know, part of me is really, really just quite, you know, quite joyous. And the other part is sad and, you know, they're all mixed together. And, and so you get a little bit of both all at the same time. I can imagine that certainly. I think it is, and we'll understand, I think everyone listening even more so as you continue, I want you to continue talking about your experience. And I said that was part A. Let's talk about part B, what that has been for you. So part B goes like this. I was in the light. I came back to my physical body, you know, sitting on the windowsill there with Willie. And this is this is the harder part to to describe because when I was with Mary Fran and Nolan, a hundred percent of my consciousness was with them in our conversation that we had. And a hundred percent of my consciousness was there in the room, in the hospital room. And I certainly didn't have the words to describe it then. I do now. I call it bilocation because I was with them in the light and I was with them in the hospital room. And I know this because that joyousness, that ecstasy was, I could feel it with my body. And, and as such, my face just w was just radiating. It was like, you know, all this emotion was, was trying to get out. And, you know, of the friends and relatives that were in the room, if they had looked in my direction, they would have seen this, this huge grin on his face. You know, I was just so happy. And it would have been completely misunderstood. And so I did the only thing I could think of, which was to cover my face with my hands until those two consciousnesses could come together again and, and I could be whole. And when that happened, you know, it took me a, a moment to be there. Then I could bring my hands down and be present in a room filled with grieving relatives and, you know, and hug people and cry on each other's shoulders and, and do what you need to do in order to um, express, you know, these two huge losses in everyone's life in the space less, less than a week. So it was, um, yes. So that's part B. There is a part C too. Ask some questions and we'll get to part C because that occurs, you know, like 15 years in the future. So one quick question is, this was the first experience you had. I'm going to call this incredibly um, transpersonal experience, you know, beyond the self, your consciousness moving beyond the self and specifically into what is described as what happens to us after we leave this body and this life and, and move into the next. I mean, I grew up in a, mainline Presbyterian church. And I have to tell you <laughs> that in the lexicon of the Presbyterian church, they don't talk about the ability for to see a dead relative come and, or, you know, in this case, Mary Fran come and scoop Nolan up out of his body and being able to experience that and then leave your physical body, go into the light and, and be able to communicate. I mean, it's, 
this was so totally outside of my concept. I didn't have a, a container with which to put this experience in. And, you know, when you look at research that's been done around near-death experiences, you know, usually when they talk about um, the common elements of a near-death experience, number one is that it's ineffable, which is this great English word that right. means we don't have an English word for it. <laughs> so, you know, it's taken me 40 years to be able to come and wrap words around um, an experience that I really couldn't describe for the longest time. It was 15 years before I talked to people about what ha happened to me. So it was, yeah, it was a long time. And partly it was ineffable and partly it was I had some fear around disclosure. Of course, and, of course. And, you know, how would my family, my friends, the church take this kind of a, an experience? Because, you know, what would they, what would they think? Would I, was I Looney Tunes or what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So that leads me right into part C. Okay. That's the last part. So um, I am at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. For those of you who don't know, St. Thomas is Minnesota's largest private university. Oh, okay. And I was doing my doctoral work there in leadership, and I'm writing my dissertation about near-death experiences. So I put out the call to, you know, I need to be able to interview some people. I'm curious, you're talking about your dissertation, and you're looking into near-death experiences, and I'm curious about the year because even now, that would be um, a very unusual topic to even get approved to have your dissertation be on your death experiences. But even further into the past, I imagine it was um, more revolutionary to be, I don't even know that that's the right word, but to be able to explore this. <laughs> it's funny because I went shopping for schools to do my doctoral work in. And when I got to the um, University of St. Thomas, I'm being interviewed by the chair of the department and a faculty member. And at some point they asked me the question, but you know, do you know what you'd like to write about? And I said, yes, I do. I would like to be able to write about God and spirituality. Can I do that here? And the two faculty members just, they looked at each other and you could see, you know, that there's something going on between the two of them. And finally, the the dean of the department <laughs> looks over and he goes, um, Scott, this is the University of St. Thomas. I said, I know. Well, we're a Catholic university. And I said, yeah, that's not, that's not a surprise. <laughs> Why are you telling me this? He said, well, you know, at a Catholic university, you really should be able to write about God and spirituality. Um, it's just that no one's ever done it. Wow. So um, they said, yeah, we will figure out a way to make that work. And that then morphed, you know, seven years later into um, writing about near-death experiences that when people have a near-death experience, they come back and they're profoundly changed. Yes. And my concept of leadership is that it's an inside-out phenomena. And so... Um, leadership is an expression of who you are and what you believe in. That's what you present to the world. So if the inside changes as the result of a profound experience, like a near-death experience, that means your leadership style is going to change. And um, that's important and that's worth noting and it's worth writing about that shift in, you know, what, how do people approach leadership who've had uh, this profound change in their life. And so I needed people to talk to. And I'm, you know, casting about for anybody who can help me find folks that have had near-death experiences. So I'm writing to hospices and hospitals and talking to counselors. And, and one of the things I did was I sent letters to Mary Fran's family because all the women in the family were involved in healthcare in some way. Oh, wow. And, and I got a letter back from one of the sisters and she said, 
10 years after Mary Fran died, um, I had a near death experience. Oh, wow. And I would love to share it with you. Okay. And so we arranged for that to happen. And it was, it's an interesting um, experience. The sister, she has decided to remain anonymous. So I'm just going to call her the sister. Okay. Um, So uh, the sister had been at a medical appointment and had a change in prescription, change in medications, and then had gone to visit her, her parents and took the medication, went upstairs to take a nap, and she had a bad reaction. And the next thing that she knows is that she is floating in this world of gray. And out of this gray cloud comes Mary Fran. And Mary Fran marches right up to her and says, you have to go back and you have to go back now. To which the sister says, wow, it's really been a long time. Nice to see you too, Mary Fran. (laughs) And Mary Fran just takes her index finger and pokes the sister right in the chest and says, I'm not kidding. You've got to go back and you've got to go back now. Wow. And it startled the sister so much so that she wound up opening her physical eyes. And when she did that, she discovered that she was on the floor of the bedroom and there was this big guy dressed in an EMT outfit. And he is had been looking down and he was turning away as she opened her eyes and he says to his partner who's standing right behind him, he says, I have done everything I can possibly do. Uh, he said, We've lost her. Now the partner who's standing behind is looking down over his shoulder, sees the sister's eyes open up and goes, Whoa, <laughs> she's oh, back. That is and, unbelievable. And they, and they do their magic and they take her to the hospital and, And she's fine to this day. She's, she did great. So um, that's the end of that story. And so I thank her and I'm packing up my recording equipment from this interview. And as I'm doing that, this little thought comes into my head and I turn to the sister and go, you know what? When Nolan made his transition, something really unusual happened to me. You were in the room. Did anything unusual happen to you? And at this point, the sister's eyes just, there's this biggest saucers. Taking that as a yes, I turned the recording equipment back on and said, all right, tell you what, you tell me your story first, then I'll tell you my story. We'll compare notes and, and that'll be fun. This is what she told me. She said, Scott, I remember that moment exactly. I was standing bedside and looking across the bed, you were sitting on the windowsill next to Willie. I said, yep, that's right. And she said, when Nolan flatlined, what I experienced, meaning the sister, what the sister, what I experienced was Mary Fran coming across the veil. She scooped Nolan up out of his physical body. The two of them had this exquisite reunion And then the two of them turned to me, embraced me, and the three of us went to the light. When we were in the light, we had a chance to affirm our love and affection for each other. We had a chance to say goodbye. And then at some point, the two of them turned and went into the light, and I came back to my physical body standing next to the bed. She used almost the exact same words that I did as I just told you a little bit ago. It's uncanny. It's, it was beyond uncanny. It was just, <laughs> I just was stunned. And in a moment, in an instant, all of those doubts and fears I had about, was I crazy? Was this a, a goofy experience? Was it just the result of me and being in deep grief? Was, you know, just vanished. Because here's another person who had exactly the same experience that I had down to the smallest detail. And it was an instant of affirmation. And from that moment on, I have never doubted my experience, what happened, the nuances of it. It was 
real. I knew it was real because it had just been confirmed for me. And flip side, that conversation wound up being profoundly important to the sister too, because she had had the same doubts that I had. Was this real? Was it? And she had never told anybody. So the two of us had um, this great healing because of that experience. And the two of us then could be really solid in terms of who we were and what we experienced. And, and it was, it was okay. It was, it was okay to share. And from that moment on, it was just like, yep, I, I can share this because I know that it's real, that I didn't make this up and that I can be um, honest about who I am and how I have changed. And I can bring um, more of me to the world. I can, you know, it, it become, I can live a more authentic life, I guess it'd be the way to say that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the end of part C and that's, I have no more parts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have a ton more. I have a million questions for you. So I'm going to try and condense the list somewhat. Yeah. But I'm sure I'm not the only one with questions. Um, one question is, how did having this shared death experience change you? You've referred to that. And I know it clearly it changed the trajectory of your career and your life. But what changed for you internally? Something that, because, you know, by making your audio programs, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, you're giving other people the chance to experience a version of this. And like you've said in um, other interviews, you know, did a little bit of um, listening to some of those, you know, near-death experiences are something that people who've had them talk about changing them profoundly. They're no longer afraid of dying. They feel more deeply spiritual. They feel more connected to everyone and everything. They feel more loving. You know, I'm not going to come even close to encapsulating what you've experienced. But I know that you said, and this is a great point, understatement, the thing with having a near-death experience yourself instead of a shared near-death experience is that you have to die and come back, which for most people probably isn't great <laughs> if you don't have to, if you don't have to actually die to have the experience. You have experienced profound change with a shared near-death experience or shared death experience rather. So I want to hear for you how how have you changed? I'm going to start that with let's be really clear about the difference between a near-death experience and a shared death experience. Please. Um, cause I think that will help frame our discussion a little bit. So, Definitely. um, in a near death experience, commonly what happens is that, um, there's some sort of an accident, something happens to the physical body and the trauma is so much that the physical body dies. And at that point, our consciousness, our soul lifts up, goes into the uh, non-physical universe and, you know, has an adventure. And then at some point there are some, there's some miracle people here in the physical plane who reanimate the body and they bring it back to life. And then, you know, we're pulled back into our physical bodies again. And at some point we are then able to talk about that experience. So that's a, in a nutshell, that's a near death experience, shared death experience. There's no physical trauma. So as you remember from my story, I'm sitting on the windowsill next to Willie. So there's nothing going on with me other than I'm grieving. And at this point, you know, I leave and it comes at the invitation of the person who's making their transition. So by definition, a near-death experience isn't the real deal. You know, because you you get to come back into the physical world again. A shared death experience, you are um, invited to go with the person who's making their final transition. So this is a true death experience, and you get to go along. 
And sometimes you go along as the observer and sometimes you get to experience it as they experience it. And so it's, it truly is shared in that sense too. And, and then, you know, you go with them and some are, are short and relatively simple like mine. Um, you know, I went into the light, we had a conversation and they went on and I came back. That's, that's pretty simple. But um, some folks get to um, experience the full meal deal. You know, they get to they get to witness the body rising up out of the out of the physical body and meet the guy, go down the tunnel, be there with the reunion of the relatives and the being of light who comes and escorts you to a place where you can have a life review. And then once that's over, you get to go to the healing and regeneration center and get a chance to wander around that area. That is our life between lives, which is the nickname of that is the park. And, you know, there's universities and there's knowledge centers and there's all the professional centers and interest centers. I mean, the place is just vast. And the person can share in that until we're done now and they come back to their physical body. So there's two main differences that you might have picked up in there. One is that there's no physical trauma. So that's a big for deal. For you, the experiencer. Yeah, uh, for, for me. The person you know. accompanying the person who is going through the dying process. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. And so I highly recommend that. As you alluded to, it's this is a... A much better way to have a spiritually transformative experience than having your body so crushed, mutilated, burnt, whatever, uh, that it takes years for most indie ears to, you know, physically recover. The second thing, and I think this is really remarkable. So there's a book that was published about a year and a half ago by William Peters. And he wrote the first extensive scientific study around shared death experiences. It's called At, Heaven, At Heaven's Door. There we go. And in it, he has an amazing statistic, which is he interviewed 900 people for this, for this study, which is a lot. And 100% of those 900 people went into a benevolent afterlife. No exceptions. Full stop. No exceptions. That in a near-death experience, sometimes there's a less than positive experience, which I'll talk about in a second. I've heard that. But in a in the final transition, when we are actually making the trip, there is no option other than to go into the the joy the unity, the love, compassion, the, the unbridled oneness that is the universe. And so that gives me great comfort that, that we are destined for a, um, a really, really amazing experience um, as we leave our physical bodies and return to our physical nature. So um, less than positive experience. There's a couple reasons for it, but a big chunk of it is um, our guides. You know, we lift out of our physical body. I, I like to liken it to the two by four alongside the head kind of conversation. Okay. <laughs> Where the, the guides come up and they just whack us. And they go, Tracy. You have not been paying attention. We have been trying to get through to you for years. You're not going down the path that you're supposed to be on. We had arranged a different mission for you, and you have willingly ignored it, and you're messing up the plan. So this is your call to action. <laughs> you know, a conversation, something like that, where, you know, it's it's a it's a reorientation. It's like, listen. This is who you wanted to be in the physical world. We designed this whole this whole experience so that you could get out of it what you wanted. Now you have free will. We grant you that. However, blah blah blah. There's you know there's a thing that you need to do. And stay so, on the path. 
Stay or on get the back path. on the or path. get on the path. <laughs> you know, you're going over here someplace, and that path you're supposed to be on, uh, it's been, it's dusty from non-use. <laughs> anyway, um, boy, I completely lost my train of thought. Pull me back, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be with you. It might be a shared. <laughs> I think this has been a shared journey, and I'm not kidding, um, because I've been very moved as you've been talking about um, oh. everything from your initial shared death experience. But also, you know, my my mind is you know going like I have a million thoughts and questions as you're talking. I can see how having this type of experience, you're talking about unity, oneness, love, remembering that you're here for a purpose. We all are. And it's important that we kind of connect to and get back on that path to that purpose. Because like you said, we have free will. We can choose to do things that aren't in line with our highest good. I'm just going to say it that way. And everybody knows kind of what that is and how that feels, right? Because we're human and we make mistakes and we do things that maybe later on we'd be like, oh, that wasn't really how I want to be. Um, so having an experience that like the ones you were going to talk about more in terms of on your audio programs where you guide people through a fact, I'm, I don't know if it's fair to say a facsimile or a different, ver a version of that shared death experience, that oneness, that connecting to something greater than the self, you're going to say it better than I will. But that has the potential to change people profoundly in a very positive way way. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how people describe having changed as a result of doing the work that you have been doing. And as you were saying that, I remembered what I was supposed to segue back to, which was how has I changed, which is essentially the same question. Um, you know, how do people change? How did I change? Um, there are a whole slew of after effects that have been um, identified by researchers, uh, 40, 50 of them. So there's a lot. Um, the ones that really um, changed me was um, intense curiosity. I was driven to enter that space again. I knew. Because I had done it once, I could go back there again. I just had to figure out how. And, and so my curiosity wound up um, looking like, well, if I really want to get back there, I wonder if the sacred, ancient sacred spaces that are around the planet have some, you know, you know, secret juju or something that would take and propel me, have a vibration that would take and propel me back into that space. Like what happened to me in the hospital room, I was, you know, thrust into that. And so right afterwards, I, I just went to, um, the great pyramids, the Sphinx, Machu Picchu. I went to Stonehenge, the Oracle of Delphi, yada, yada, yada. I went to more cathedrals than you could shake a stick at. And what happened as a result was, um, I had some wonderful vacations. But in terms of my ability to, you know, get propelled into the non-physical, just crickets. Yeah, I just, <laughs> nothing going on. So I said, okay, so maybe this needs to be more active. So I studied with shamans in North America and South America. I went and studied with the uh, Omoto religion in Japan. And that was a little better, eh, but it wasn't until I discovered the work of Bob Monroe He's the guy who first wrote about out-of-body experiences. Back in 1971, he published a book called Journeys Out of the Body. And I read the book and I went, he has gone someplace that is really close to where I want to go. I bet I could use his techniques to take me where I want to go. And so I went to the Monroe Institute and I took a their gateway, which is the very first class, you know, I wore the headphones, I did the meditations and had my socks blown off. Just wonderful. 
And by the second um, week long workshop that I had, that I attended, I had an active uh, relationship with Mary Fran and Nolan. And in encounter, you actually reconnected with them. I reconnected with them and, and to this day still have that active um, relationship. Um, Mary Fran tends to come in and out, you know, she'll, she'll be around for a while and then she goes off and comes back in and it goes off. Nolan, on the other hand, um, he's around all the time. He's like right there, you know, he's looking over my shoulder and just, he's a great kid. No, can I, he's, not a, he's not a kid so much anymore. He's in his 40s. So <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you about that? Because I want because I'm sure people listening are wondering, does this does this guy mean that they're really hanging out or that you're aware of an internal relationship with them? That's interesting. Um, I had quite drawn a distinction like that. So when the methodology that Monroe uses is binaural beats. So you wear headphones and the special sound technologies. We can talk about that later. But what it does is it helps you to enter into a deep state of meditation, a state of yes. expanded awareness so that you can enter into it and hold it for 35, 40 minutes. So it gives you time to learn tools and techniques in order to sustain that experience and communicate within that experience and travel around and and so you know what to do. Um, and, and so I perceive them um, like you would perceive something in meditation. Okay. So it's um, sometimes they show up visually. So that's when you are doing imagination in your head. It's kind of that screen, you know, yes. that's about halfway through your head. Well, that's where they'll show up. Um, but after a while... Um, I get so used to their presence that they no longer need to be visual. It can be, um, I call it an energetic signature. You know, you go into that space and you go, oh, that's Mary Fran. Hi. <laughs> and, or, you know, so it doesn't necessarily have to be visual anymore. It can, it can be, uh, it can take other forms and which is important. Um, because well, it's a lot easier, frankly, <laughs> you just recognize them and you go, Oh yeah. What's, what do you got for me? I'm debating whether to share this, not so much with you, but <laughs> with anyone who will listen, because I think for people who haven't had some version of an experience where their consciousness is not limited one, you know, I think we know that our consciousness is not limited to our brains and bodies. And in meditative states and expanded states of awareness, that becomes very clear. And I truly believe, and I'm sure you do too, that anyone can make that shift. And a lot of times our, our paradigms limit what we actually do experience. Um, if we like, if you don't believe it's possible, it's just might make it a little bit more challenging at first to experience it unless you have an experience that's spontaneous, like the one you reported with Mary Fran and Nolan, but I have a friend, a very close friend who passed away, not my first friend to pass away by any means, um, but who passed away in May. And I, I, I told my husband, I absolutely feel that I have an ongoing relationship with him. And it's not that he's hanging out in the corner, although maybe he is now, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, in the few days after his funeral, you know, I wasn't sleeping well at all. I had to get up a lot in the middle of the night because it, it's a long story, but my, one of my dogs is, um, I'm going to say physically challenged and has to go out sometimes multiple times a night. So I was never fully in this deep sleep, but in that kind of liminal space, that floaty space, I 100% felt that I was interacting with him in this, some sort of plane. And, and, and we were having conversations. I was aware that he had passed. I felt very connected to him. Um, and, and in fact, he showed me a scene of where we would wind up living that was uncannily accurate. I mean, it was a house we had not ever been inside and he walked me through it. I mean, I, it was as real as me sitting here talking to you. And, um, 
very often I'll be doing something and I'll think of him, you know, and you can tell the difference between what feels like a simple memory, which is still lovely and something where it feels like, oh, hey, <laughs> you know, how are you doing? You know, like, it's great to feel that some version of your presence. Um, that was just kind of a tangent, but what you're describing is that anyone can train themselves to have that sort of experience. And getting back to what we were talking about earlier, people have such an understandable fear of their own mortality and of the pain of loss and the feeling that somebody that that someone that they love is inaccessible and it's not quite the case no it's not and we have you know there's that term that the the veil between this world and the next is really thin and that is the truth that we have the ability to part that veil anytime that we want in order to either enter that space or get communication from the other side. Speaking of which, when, when you were talking, it reminded me that we are using language that is appropriate for a physical being in our five physical senses. And when we're in this space, um, that's not necessarily the way it works. I mean, yes, we have, we can receive information in the the five physical senses that we're used to, you know, you know, visual and hearing and touch and taste and smell. But when we're in this other space, because we have entered into this other space, there are other ways in which you begin to learn things. Case in point, you know, when I was with Mary Fran and Nolan, I came back and I, you know, I was profoundly grateful profoundly grateful that it wasn't done in English, that English has such boundaries on words that you can't get the full conception of an emotion, for instance, you know, as, as we're saying goodbye or we're affirming our love and affection for each other. It's not just a word, it's the whole thing. And so it's telepathic, but it it has it has all the richness and fullness that is available. So emotion is one of the languages that um, that we can communicate with. Uh, so is something called synesthesia, which is this mixing of senses. So you, uh, for instance, you could smell a color. So you're in this space, and then all of a sudden, you know, in comes this mixed sense, and at at first, it doesn't you're like what? What is that? But after a while, you begin to go, "Oh, that provides more information for me, more texture, more um, um, nuance than just that physical sense alone." Intuition, you know, sometimes you just know something. You're like there's there's no context for it; you just know it. Well, and sorry, that, that has um, that has heightened for you since your initial experience. Yep. So um, one of the many things that has changed for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, imagination. That's where imagination comes from. It's that non-physical universe. And the last one actually applies to us here in the physical world. And that is um, synchronicity or um, coincidence. For instance, um, you know, say uh, my grandmother, Ginny, passes away. And in her life, she loved the bird, the cardinal. So now all of a sudden, cardinals are showing up in very unusual places at very unusual times. And so you begin to recognize, oh, that's Grandma Jenny just popping in to say, hi, love you, see you later, you know, and <laughs> off they go. So it's, it's a rich experience. It's something that takes a little bit of time to, be, to understand that languaging a little bit. But that's the journey. That's the adventure. That's that's the fun of of exploring these realms, because in the exploration of it, you lose the fear, because fear is really about not knowing what's going to happen. And we now know really clearly what the typical transition looks like, and 
and you can do these steps in meditation and you can, you know, you can meet your escort. You can go down and explore the tunnel. You can go into the light. There are three, by the way, and you can go, you know, meet your dead relatives and have a life review. I mean, you can do all these things by using meditation and it's calmer, gentler. You have more time. And as a, and as you practice, I mean, the fear just leaves because you know where you're going and how you're going to get there and what's likely to happen. And you might even plan a little bit for, I would like this to happen. And so you can do that. And that makes it just wonderful. Now, pause. I say this like, you know, I could walk into a burning building and rescue kids and not be afraid that I was going to die because I have no fear of death, which I don't. But let me make a distinction between uh, my soul being not afraid to die, and it's not. You know, I've done this work for so long now that it's just, it just seems like the next step. And my body, now my body has a mind of its own. And, you know, if it gets into danger, it's telling me in very loud voices that it doesn't want to be hurt. <laughs> and it doesn't want to suffer pain because that's not a good thing. You know, so there's the two things going on. So the idea that we need to recognize that we are a physical being, that's important because the body wants to be respected. It wants it to be taken care of. And, and it is a magnificent vehicle to explore the physical universe. But when it's no longer needed, you know, and we make, and we leave our physical body you know, there's no no reason to be afraid whatsoever because I'm, the people that I interviewed for near death experience they will use expressions like it's it's as easy as taking your next breath or your next step. You don't think about it. It's not a it's it's something that just happens. And for most of us, I mean, we've made this trip into the physical world a lot, and we've had lots of lives and. And so there's this sense of remembering when we take that, um, when we leave our physical body, it's like, yep, time to go home. I had a, <laughs> a guy who I was talking to, he had a heart attack and he's lying on his living room floor and his, his best friend in the whole world was an EMT. And sure enough, this EM, his, his buddy was the EMT that got called. And so, you know, as he's he's lying there, his physical body is lying on the floor. His non-physical body is up on the ceiling looking down. And, and you know, there's his buddy Fred and his buddy Fred's, you know, doing the chest compressions and, you know, whatever magic EMTs do. And he said to me, he says, you know, it's the strangest thing because I'm sitting down there, I'm floating next to the ceiling and there's Fred down there. And the only thought that comes to my head is, I didn't realize how much male pattern baldness he has. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so isn't that a wonderful statement? Because what it means is that Fred is down there working and our person making their transition is perfectly at home with this situation. It's not, oh my not God. Not worried. Not worried. It's, not it's fearful. It's familiar. It, you know, it's just like, oh. It's observing. I, yeah, he's going bald. Son of a gun. Never noticed. <laughs> Guess he always had that baseball hat on for a reason. Huh. You know, just so offhand about that situation. I think and that has a lot to tell us about what it will be like for us when, when we make our transition, that it's going to be smooth. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is the next step. And Not it's it. nice to know what, what you're going to do. Oh, yeah, you know. And by the way, for all you listening, the shorthand is go to the light. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, just go to the light and you're good to go. <laughs> I, good advice. Great advice. So I'm going to ask you a few super quick questions and then one that might take a little bit more to answer or there may not be a clear answer. So to recap, some of the many positive changes people could experience doing this work, the near-death experience meditations. Um, increased sense of um, ease, 
decreased, no fear of death, increased feeling of connection with people that we've lost, mm -hmm. increased intuition, increased sense of our purpose, increased creativity. Um, I'm sure a million other positive things, but basically stepping more into the person we ideally want to be and with greater ease. The one I would add to that Please. that um, took me a while to be, begin to fully realize is that um, what we are doing is exploring the nature of our multidimensional self because we are not this little soul that exists in this physical body. We exist on all levels, all dimensions, all at the same time. We are big, beautiful, expansive beings that have tremendous capabilities. And we have adopted a lot of filters in order for us to be here in the physical world. And, you know, we are able to perceive enough information so that we can survive here in this uh, world of duality. But we are not dualistic. We are at home in the unity universe. And we are extraordinary human beings that I mean, to be a human being means that we exist on all of these levels at once. And the, this work is about discovering, remembering that we have all of these capabilities and they're available to us here in the physical world. And that is just more fun than one person should have. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so there's all those benefits that we talked about, you know, plus what we think we are, you know, we have purposely forgotten that, you know, mm -hmm. once that we are extraordinary and we have all these capabilities and there is nothing to fear in the universe because we are powerful, magnificent, loving beings that that are connected and then that's our job is to is to learn what that means and then how can we bring those gifts of that knowledge into the physical world so that we can live lives here with filled with more peace and joy beautiful now you mentioned before the monroe institute technology binaural beats, you know, the way I typically explain binaural beats is that it is an auditory technology that, you know, a type of brainwave entrainment that whatever the desired brainwave state is for the purpose we want to achieve. So if it's to go deeper into meditation or to achieve deep sleep or greater relaxation, that technology helps facilitate that more rapidly, helps us sustain it. Your audio programs contain that technology. So um, Bob and Roe wrote this book about out-of-body experiences, and he it was on the bestseller list for a long, long time. Yeah. And back in 1971, this is breakthrough stuff. And so... Um, people, when they read it, they said, you know, they wanted to do that, or they wanted to know the wisdom that came out of these experiences. So the demand was such that Bob said, I have to be able to teach people how to do what I do. And essentially, yeah, you wear these headphones, it's an audio technology. And he had happened upon, binaural beats had been around since like the 1880s when they discovered the differential, la, la, la. Bob's genius was that he layered them. Nobody had done that before. And so if I was to play the two tones and the differential is four, you know, Tracy, if, if you were going to, if I put that on your head right now, you'd fall deep asleep because that is the, the frequency level of deep sleep. Well, what Bob did is he merged that with say the frequency of 12. And that's where you and I are right now, where we're bright, awake, and clear. And so if you play the two at the same time, that you enter into a state where your body is asleep, but your mind is bright, awake, and clear. 
that's the state that he did all his out of out of body explorations from and so he was able through the use of sound to put people into a vibratory level that made it more oh dear I just about made a grammar pro <laughs> it made it easier for them to lift out of their body and explore in the wherever they wanted to go so I had you know, I've taught for them for 35 years, was their executive director for two years. For the Monroe Institute. For, for Monroe Institute. And so what I decided to do was to take their technology and their um, techniques. And, you know, Bob Monroe has a, has a cosmology that's all his own. But guess what? There's a, millions of people that have had near-death experiences. That's another cosmology that says, you know, the... The universe is organized this way and you can explore it in a particular way. So that's what I did. So we adjusted the frequency so that you're able, there's a frequency that's associated with guidance and another one that's associated with that tunnel. And there's three different frequencies that are associated with the different types of light that you're able to enter into. And that meeting place where you get to talk to your dead relatives and friends and pets that's a frequency and the being that takes you to a place where you can have a life review that's another place and then there's the park that vast area where we live life between lives we have this ability to take and tweak a really nice audio technology and the cool thing about binaural beats is that you learn it so you when you wear the headphones you know for the first couple i don't know four five six times you're kind of learning what it feels like to enter into the white light. It's so fascinating. It really is. And it's so important. And I'm just thinking about how useful your your work and your programs are for you know, people dealing with grief that has been really hard to move through um, to help us get out of this very... Um, this, I don't know a better way to explain it, but like this, it's like, it feels like a painful cocoon, right? And expand our awareness to get, you know, a broader view. And I know that doesn't even fully capture it. Um, so I, you I, think using the language we were just having, um, grief is a very slow vibration. And, and, you know, it, and when you talk about that, it brings us down and it, and it brings us close. And um, by using binaural beats, even if they're, you know, behind music or something, it helps us to expand and to loosen up those, um, those feelings of, of being, uh, of a slow vibration. We can raise our vibrations. And when we do that, you know, we naturally come out of that cocoon and boy, it's helpful. That's just great. I want to be mindful of your time. I'd love for you to talk about your audio programs that are available and any classes or workshops that you'd like people to know about or anything else and, and how to get in touch with you or the Monroe Institute. Thank you for that. Um, so the centerpiece of, of all the information about me is my website. Um, it is near death meditations, plural, dot com neardeathmeditations.com and there there's a video of my story there's a link to my youtube channel um, which has some really wonderful um, interviews with people who've had near-death experiences shared death experiences and the top researchers in the field wonderful. so that's fun and in the process of developing a workshop around how to you know how do you go through that near-death experience, I, I wrote and recorded six albums. Um, they're for sale on the website, really inexpensive. They're like 25 bucks and you get to, you know, go see your dead grandma. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really easy. And, um, but and I have two of them actually. And bless your heart. Thank you. And, and they're, they're great. And they're very powerfully transformative. And, uh, currently I'm on the faculty of the shift network um they're an online learning platform for all things woo woo so you can check them out at theshiftnetwork.com and the neat thing about the shift network is that um they 
Uh, you can attend classes live. We record them and then they are available in the library for on demand. So, you know, if you don't happen to be available for those seven weeks in May, not to worry, you can take the class and take it anytime you want. I find this work is really handy if you have a guide. Somebody can tell you, this is how you turn left. This is how you turn right. This is how we think about those 10 modes of perception. Uh, you practice them, you know, that kind of stuff. It's an adventure that never stops. And it's really lovely to be able to stay connected with those who have, that we've lost in the physical world and have transitioned out, you know, and for the very reason that it allows us more peace and joy in this world. And I think that's the big deal is, you know, how do we live in this world more fully, more authentically? Well, you know, part of it is learning to meditate and being in a expanded state that will seem familiar to you when you're there and you go, oh, I, I don't know what this feels like, but then knowing what to do when you're there. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Tracy. Well, that's really beautiful. Scott, thank you so much for making the time to speak with me today. This is so important and, and fascinating. I had such a great time speaking with you. We did have fun, didn't we? We did. <laughs> thank you for the invitation once again. Uh, this, is, this has been great. So this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you enjoyed the episode, please do remember to like, share, and follow. Give Scott a follow as well. And until next time, as always, be well.